Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Hi, I'm John Hamilton here with Link TV's Earth Focus. I'm speaking today with Bill McKibben. He's a founder of the Climate Action Group 350.org, the author of many books, including Earth, and more recently, A Global Warming Reader, which he edited. Bill McKibben, thank you so much for joining us here. Such a pleasure to be with you. Well, Bill, as we record this here in September, you're just back from Washington, D.C., where climate justice activists engaged in what's being called the largest civil disobedience campaign for the climate in United States history. Talk about what happened. I think this probably was about the largest civil disobedience action of anything, of any kind, for certainly this century in this country. It was, um, it was quite remarkable. For two weeks, we managed to have daily arrests outside the White House. By the time we were done, 1,253 people from all 50 states had been arrested. And we were there protesting this proposed pipeline from the tar sands of northern Alberta down to the Gulf of Mexico. And I think the reason that so many people turned out was kind of twofold. One, this is a horrible project. These tar sands, to dig them up, creates an enormous, like, you know, United Kingdom-sized mess in the middle of beautiful native ancestral landscapes. Taking this stuff over the middle of the Ogala Aquifer in a pipeline is a clearly a poor idea. Most of all, this is the second largest pool of carbon on Earth up there. And if we burn it in a big way, as Jim Hansen at NASA our foremost climate scientist put it, it's essentially game over for the climate. Why was it so important that people had to put their bodies on the line and why target the White House in particular? For once, the president's going to make a decision by himself. Congress isn't in on this one. He does not have to convince our dysfunctional Congress to do anything. He just has to decide whether or not to sign this piece of paper called the Presidential Certificate of National Interest and allow this pipeline to go forward. And so that's the other reason that people were so motivated to be there. It's a huge step that he actually could take. And people were eager, therefore, to go remind him, I think, why they'd been so excited about his presidency and try to, try to show him that he has the support he needs to do the right thing. And of course, you're the founder of the group 350.org. A lot of people might think 350 is a peculiar name for a climate justice group. In fact, it is a deeply peculiar name. So why, why 350? Why is that the magic number? In January of 2008, the aforementioned Mr. Hansen and his uh, team at NASA published uh, a key paper, maybe the key scientific paper of this millennia so far. And they said, we now know enough, looking at real-time observation and at paleoclimatic data, we know enough to say how much carbon is too much. They said, any value for carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million is not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted, end quote. That's very strong language for a scientist to use. And it's much stronger still when you know that wherever you are, you know, outside in Berkeley here or in Boston or in Buenos Aires or in Beijing, the atmosphere is 393 parts per million CO2 now. Global warming is the first global problem that we've faced, the first truly global problem. And trying to organize on a global basis is a very difficult thing if for no other reason than people all over the world insist on speaking their own language. You know? Arabic numerals cut across those linguistic boundaries. So 350 means the same thing in California and Caliente and China and wherever you happen to be. We've had three big global days of action now, and CNN has called them the most widespread days of political activity in the planet's history. More than 15,000 demonstrations altogether in every country on Earth except North Korea. Well, we saw them come out in their hundreds of thousands during these 350 days of action all across the world. But as we look to the impediments to taking any real action to stave off climate change, 
we have to look inward here in the United States. This is one of the biggest polluters oh, in the world, and it's also one of the biggest stumbling blocks. It is probably the biggest stumbling block. And, you know, here's the thing. Um, we're building a movement, which is a good thing, and there hasn't been one before. The reason that we have to build a movement is because the financial power of the fossil fuel industry is so great that it has heretofore prevented action of any kind. We spent a long time thinking that if scientists sort of whispered in the ears of politicians the problems that we were facing, they would do something about it. The problem is that while scientists are whispering in one ear, ExxonMobil is bellowing in the other and drowning them out. And of course, if we look around the country, Texas is the oil capital of the United States. Uh, Texas, in the summer of 2011, endured record-setting temperatures, bone-dry conditions. We saw wildfires outside of Austin. And yet the state's governor, Rick Perry, who's now the front-runner for the Republican presidential nomination, has said he doesn't even think climate change is real. First of all, the situation in Texas is really, really wild. During those fires in early September, the state's forest fire chief said, and I quote, no human being has ever fought fires in these conditions before. He's probably right. It was drier and hotter there than it's ever been recorded, certainly in Texas, and just unbelievable firestorms everywhere. Governor Perry response to the drought that his state meteorologist has certified as deeper than the Dust Bowl, his response has been a day of prayer. Now, I'm a Methodist Sunday School teacher, so I'm happy with prayer, and I think it's a good thing to do. And I also think that probably if you're going to be praying, you also should be doing the things that you need to do to help your problem. And those things are to finally say no to the fossil fuel industry, um, to stand up to the people who are driving this problem, not to just take some more of their money and preach their line. So I, it doesn't completely surprise me that Rick Perry's prayers have, as of yet, been unanswered. And of course, we are in the heated 2012 presidential election cycle, which seems to begin earlier every four years. Um, perhaps a bit of hope in one of the early uh, GOP debates, uh, former Utah Governor John Huntsman actually called out Rick Perry and other uh, Republicans who are both creationists and global warming deniers. And he said, look, we can't as a Republican Party be anti-science. We can't ignore it when 98 out of 100 climate scientists tell us this is a real problem. I guess there'd be a little more hope if John Huntsman was a little farther above 1% in the polls in the Republican primary. It's actually a great shame, a great mark of shame that one of our great political parties has reached the point where it's considered unusual and courageous to stand up for the most obvious and basic scientific truths, you know. And yet it was the climate delegation of the Obama administration that so many people said was an impediment to any binding solution to climate change at the UN climate talks. Well, this is the real problem. I mean, I think the deeper one. Um, President Obama has talked a wonderful game on climate. When he was campaigning, he said remarkable things. He said, on the night of his nomination, he said, in my presidency, the rise of the oceans will begin to slow and the planet will begin to heal. Saying things like that was one of the reasons that he won absolutely unprecedented support from young people in the last election. Never been a margin like that for young people. And 18 to 29 year olds listed climate change and energy as their single biggest issue when they voted in 2008. Well, he's not, you know, if you didn't mean it, you shouldn't have said it because his failure to live up to that kind of thing is disillusioning people in large numbers. Uh, it's going to be hard if he goes ahead and lets them build this Keystone Pipeline, for instance, to get those people to come back out and do what they did four years ago. We need him to do the right thing sometime so that we have some way to kind of reignite that surge. Else I'm worried we're going to end up with some one of these anti-science uh, uh, know-nothings, really, from, from the right. So what's your advice to these young people, to, these, uh, to the backbone of the 350.org movement in this election year? How do we confront this? Voting 
is something you do once every four years, at least for president. Okay? That shouldn't be your main political outlet. I mean, when the time comes to vote, go vote for whoever. It's a very strategic, utilitarian choice. Okay? But politics is something you do every day. It needs to be something you do every day. And we've got to be out fighting this climate battle hard, holding people accountable. Everybody in place after place after place is figuring it out. The question is, are we going to have in place those kind of networks and things to push for the political solutions that we need as people come to this recognition? And that's one of the things we're really keen on at 350.org. And yet the movement is addressing staving off the worst effects of climate change. And I'm curious, I mean, we're looking at a political movement that is trying to make things less bad. And in the face of that, knowing full well that sea levels are rising and are going to continue to rise, that these droughts, these floods are going to get worse, what gives you hope? Well, look, we're not going to stop global warming. That's no longer a possibility. We've raised the temperature of the planet one degree already. But the climatologists tell us that unless we get our act together very quickly, that one degree will be four degrees before the century is out. And there's no reason to think civilization can cope with that kind of change. We're already strained by what we've done so far. Um, what gives me, and so I don't always hope. There are days when I'm very despairing. I mean, the cheerful title of the first book that I wrote about all this 22 years ago was The End of Nature, okay? So I'm no Pollyanna. When I'm hopeful, it's when I go and look at the thousands of pictures in the Flickr account from these 350 rallies all over the earth. And what they demonstrate is an awakened and passionate citizenry ready to go to work. The only thing that stands between us and effective action at this point is the absurd financial power of the fossil fuel industry. We have to figure out alternate currencies to work in because we're never going to have as much money as Exxon. So sometimes it's our bodies and we're in jail. And sometimes it's our creativity and our spirit and our passion. I don't know whether it's going to be enough, but we're making the fight finally, and the odds are improving. Bill McKibben, founder of 350.org, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world. To learn more, visit linktv.org.